Yeah, thank you everybody for coming out tonight. It's nice to see you. And um, I wanted to begin by acknowledging that we're meeting on unceded Coast Salish territory. I'd also like to wish a happy new year to those of you who celebrate Rosh Hashanah. And finally, I, I wanted to note the loss of Jim Deva uh, of Little Sisters Bookstore, uh, who just made a huge impact on the Vancouver community and did a lot of the kind of work that I'm going to be referencing in my talk tonight. So I have about hmm, 35, 40 minutes to lay out what's pretty complex terrain. Uh, and for a presenter, choosing what pieces to pick out and how to assemble them without doing damage to the project is a significant challenge. And this is my project tonight. Um, I prepared this talk on the assumption uh, that most of you are looking to better understand what pinkwashing is, uh, what Queers Against Israeli Apartheid is all about, and why queers would boycott a queer event. And to do this in the time that I have requires flattening out a good deal of uh, history um, that I'm about to review, but I suppose that's always the nature of a short talk. So that being said, uh, I want to draw attention tonight to two main political strategies that I think are really helpful in understanding the present conflict between queers for and against the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement called, referred to as BDS, and PACB, the Palestinian campaign for the academic and cultural boycott, for, uh, boycott of Israel. Uh, and the first of these is, uh, the first of these political strategies is a politics of identification, uh, which is a politics based on identifying with. And the second is uh, identity politics, which is a politics based on identifying as. So that's one of the distinctions that I want to make tonight. So I'm going to begin with an overview of these two types of political uh, strategies, as we've seen them play out in Canada and the U.S. since the late 60s. And then I'll introduce brand, the Brand Israel campaign and how it's been targeting the LGBTQ community as a market in order to improve its international image. And then finally, I want to look at the opposition to that development as it has played out at film festivals and Toronto's Pride Parade. In the late 1960s, the act of coming out was regarded as revolutionary in at least two ways. First, it would disrupt the existing social, economic, and political order, which placed married white heterosexuals at the top and everyone else in a descending order according to variables such as race, class, ability, uh, and sex or gender of one's intimate partner choice or choices. Uh, the act of coming out would upset the hierarchical apple cart, so to speak, uh, and would force a reconsideration of the foundations to wit the reproductive, gender normative, monogamous, white family based on which society is organized. The potential for change seemed limitless and profound and very, very exhilarating. If the white heterosexual family was no longer holding court at the top of the pyramid, if the whole system was overturned, then anything was possible. And we're not talking here about living a lesbian or gay life free from oppression, but any kind of configuration of intimacy and desire. This vision was a vision of radical transformation, not reform. Gay liberationists were undoubtedly even more convinced by the radical nature of their movement because it was met with such violent resistance. And so too were other movements subjected to state violence, movements uh, to which the gay and women's liberation, uh, liberationists allied, aligned themselves, even if those movements were not supportive of gay or women's liberation. And the point I want to emphasize here is that gay liberation was never just about gays. It also saw class and elitism as connected to sexual oppression. Liberationists challenged the American war machine and militarism. 
And they used sex in overt, in-your-face, and humorous ways to constantly unsettle the norm. Significantly, rather than present an image of themselves as a corrective to the stereotype, they embraced the stereotype and turned it on its head, so to speak. Thank you for getting that. <laughs> It gleefully embraced the worst that society threw at it and threw it back. It did not uh, set out to placate straight society that queers were just like everyone else to show that all those myths were wrong. The strategy and the vision was much different. It was the job of the liberationists to unsettle, to disturb, to destabilize. Liberation meant that everyone would be free from the system of oppression, including uh, the division of society into heterosexual and homosexual. One of my favorite quotes when I lecture on this period uh, in class is from Maurice Flood, who actually was an activist from Vancouver, uh, who was on the front lines of the gay liberation movement. And he, he, he famously said, I am not gay, I am from the future. <laughs> He didn't mean, I always have to explain this to my students, he didn't mean that in the future gays would be so accepted that they wouldn't have to identify as gay, which is how my students usually interpret it. Um, but rather he meant that these were constructed categories that would fall away and be replaced with a more expansive vision of sexuality, one that would liberate everyone, not just queers. It was a movement that identified with in this case, other anti-oppression struggles. It was not a movement that identified as. Ah, sorry, this is, I decided to skip this, but yeah, there we go. See, identifying with, this is my fancy PowerPoint tools. We're gonna have to wait, there we go, it's done. <laughs> and so we can see here, gay power, black power, women power, student power, all power to the people. So its vision was expansive. African-American feminists were the most absolute on this point. I am not free while any woman is unfree, wrote Audre Lorde, even when her shackles are very different from my own. And this same sentiment was repeated by many black women, including our own Rosemary Brown. And I was very delighted recently when I went to use the law library at UBC to see that they had uh, engraved on a public bench out there pretty much the same quote from Rosemary Brown, who was a local uh, African-Canadian uh, politician here in BC. By 1972-73, however, the movement shifted to a politics of identity. Most people, it appeared, didn't want revolution. They wanted equality. They didn't want to reorganize society. They wanted to be part of it, fully and fairly. And let's be clear, even revolutionaries have to start somewhere. And if not a violent takeover of the state, then perhaps here, with legislative protection. Actually, in Canada, of course, these issues don't make their way up to the Supreme Court for quite a while, but let's use this image as a stand-in for the state and its various regulatory functions wherever we find them. In the US, the gay rights movement, now notice the shift from gay liberation to gay rights, it's an important one, borrowed a page from the Civil Rights Handbook and sought protection from discrimination in housing, employment, uh, and so on, from municipal governments. In Canada, the emerging human rights regime, which took the form of provincial tribunals assigned to ensure that human rights were protected, became the venue for establishing protection from discrimination for lesbians and gays. More rights-seeking than revolutionary, the movement shifted toward a liberal frame, framework of inclusion. This shift reversed the direction of the liberationist vision from anti and post-identity politics. The lesbian and gay movement now engaged identity politics. Under this model, the objective was, modifi was to modify the status quo to include lesbians and gays, not to overturn the status quo. 
Now, I want to be clear that while this move had normalizing tendencies, it was not always a, a homonormative vision that was at work in this early period, the 70s and the 80s. And by homonormative, I mean the notion that gays and lesbians are unique only in their partner uh, choice, that in every other way they're, quote unquote, just like everyone else. This point of view differs from one that takes advantage of one's outsider standpoint to queer the social and, by extension, the economic and the political. Anti-discrimination laws only make sense from a place of identity. Anti-discrimination, after all, is based on identification as, not with. Intentionally or unintentionally, and I'll say as an aside, there was a lot of intentionally. The pursuit of gay rights entrenched an essentialist framework and abandoned the revolutionary liberationist vision that preceded it. Now we're jumping ahead to the late 80s and the 90s, and we can only make a brief stop here. And I just want to say that the AIDS crisis showed how little had actually been accomplished by an identity politics approach and crafted a new, more radical response, one that attached the systemic and structural inequalities that made the AIDS crisis a crisis. Sorry, that should be attacked, not attached. Uh, this political experience led to the formation of Queer Nation and to the popularization of queer as both a verb and a noun, as in to be queer and also to queer something. Like gay liberation, queer is an anti-identity. But it's different from gay liberation, which held a point of view that everyone could be liberated from the notion from sexual constructs. Queer, on the other hand, relies on the norm for its very definition. It's the norm in all its guises, then, that becomes the target. OK, so I want to talk now about Black Laundry, which is the first Israeli group to adopt a queer politic, a, cl a queer political style. And they did so in response to the second intifada, uh, intifada in 2000. Uh, like gay liberation, uh, ACT UP, and Queer Nation, Black Laundry was a direct action group that sought to draw attention to the situation of Palestinians and to make queers uncomfortable with their complicity in the oppression of another group. Now, they did many, many actions. Some of them are great. One of them that I love is um, because, of course, they would be arrested or otherwise shut down, they integrated themselves into a very, very busy business intersection at lunchtime, so they kept crossing with all the traffic, so you couldn't tell who was black laundry and who wasn't. Uh, so it's a very interesting strategy. Um, but I'm going to focus on two actions, both of which took place at gay pride parades in Tel Aviv. Uh, in 2001, 200 people dressed in black uh, and floated black balloons with signs reading, there's no pride in the occupation. Like gay prides elsewhere, the event, which had long be been a combination of the celebratory and the political, had over the years become mainstream and commercial. A part of the Black Laundry's objective was to reinsert political debate into Pride and, of course, to engage the LGBTQ community in the issues at stake for Israelis. I want to show you their action during 2003 Pride, the last parade in which they had a strong presence. So they handed out identity cards, um, but they played with the genre. So here's what they wrote in their handout sheet. The identity card, which the law requires us to carry, does not reflect our real identity. If you also think that the identity cards are a part of a system which oppresses transgenders, the intersexed, migrant workers, Palestinians, lesbians, gays, and other groups, come march with us at the Tel Aviv Pride Parade. And they say where they'll, they'll meet. Come with the gender appearance you find suitable for that morning and bring a hat. <laughs> Our flyer is an orange identity card, the kind the Israeli government issues to Palestinians, to separate between them and the Israelis with blue identity cards. The text on the card uh, is translated here. So you can see it's from, the card is from the, the fucked up ministry. 
Um, it's an imposter card. It's uh, the last name, under last name, it says it's my father's name, not my name, and so on. Under sex, it says yes, please. Um, so you can see the kind of the parallels with earlier gay liberationist uh, sort of cheekiness. Um, but also, it's a, and then a, a per, my favorite one is personal status, not glamorous. <laughs> so it's really speaking against the kind of way in which pride has become this very uh, glittery, glamorous uh, kind of event. Um, and they're getting gritty and they're getting uh, political. They were the first group in Israel to embrace queer as a term of collective identity. And we can see this in the way the identity card protest rejected gay and lesbian and gender normative identities. The way in which it was playful and humorous while at the same time having serious political teeth. We can also see how it identifies with rather than as. Every nation engages in public relations. Up until the 2000s, the government of Israel's main strategy to manage its image internationally was to counter news stories that put Israel in a negative light with, its, with the government's own point of view on military conflicts. In the 2000s, however, a new approach was embraced to rebrand Israel entirely. This, this, the Brand Israel campaign was launched in 2005, and we can see it being reported here. Um, so the idea behind this was to radically transform the image of Israel by not engaging with the conflict. So as this article says uh, further down off the screen there, uh, Ido Aharoni, the Israeli official who convened the Brand Israel group, uh, said about the previous style of PR, they're convinced that Americans don't know enough about the conflict. What the Americans are telling us loud and clear is that they don't want to hear any more about the conflict. So instead of militaristic and religious images, Brand Israel set out to change what people thought of when they heard Israel. Brand Israel wanted people to think relevant and modern. It would market the nation as young, hip, fun, and cosmopolitan, which is, of course, a code word for liberal and tolerant. Israel would appear as a, quote, productive, vibrant, and cutting-edge culture. Haroni and others called upon Jewish organizations in the US and Canada to do a lot of the groundwork. It was going to be an all-hands-on-deck operation. An East-West Global Nation Brand Perception Index showed that Israel was one, ranked 192 out of 200 nations behind North Korea, Cuba, and Yemen. So they had a lot of work to do. One of the earliest moves toward rebranding Israel was this 2007 Maxim ad. This featured women of the Israeli army. We'll stop here to say only that the campaign's initial target was a young male heterosexual audience, but let's now turn to the issue that has engaged segments of the queer community here in Canada, the US, and elsewhere. A main arm of the Brand Israel campaign has been to promote Israel as a gay-friendly vacation spot. Ads such as this one ran in a wide range of gay Canadian and American publications in the 2000s. The strategy gained traction in important circles. In 2009, the International Gay and Lesbian Travel Association announced an October conference in Tel Aviv with the goal of promoting Israel as a, quote, world gay destination. Halem, a, Le a Lebanese LGBTQ organization, responded with a call for a boycott. Quote, Tel Aviv's flashy coffee shops and shopping malls in contrast with the near nearby deprived Palestinian villages and towns, uh, serve as evidence that the Israeli society, just as the Israeli state itself, has built walls, blockades, and systems of racist segregations to hide from the Palestinians it oppresses. The intersection of physical and societal separations and barriers have justly earned the term apartheid referring to an historically parallel racist regime in South Africa 
against the indigenous black population of that country. Leisure tourism to apartheid Israel supports this regime. It is not neutral, and it certainly is not a step toward real peace, which can only be based on justice. End of quote. A year later, uh, Palestinian queers for BDS launched their own campaign. And now I'll quote from their first press release. As Palestinian queers, we see the queer movements as political in their nature, and ones that analyze the intersections between different struggles, evaluate relations of power, and try to challenge them. We firmly believe that fighting for the rights of oppressed and marginalized queer minorities cannot be separated from fighting against all forms of oppression around the world. This is evident in the proud history of the queer movement worldwide, which has joined numerous global socio-political struggles against manifestations of oppression, imperialism, injustice, and discrimination wherever they exist. It, in continuation with, to this proud history, we Palestinian queer activists call upon the LGBTQI communities around the globe to stand for justice in Palestine through adopting and implementing broad boycott, divestment, and sanctions against Israel until the latter has ended its multi-tiered oppression of the Palestinian people in line with the 2005 Palestinian civil call for BDS. The statement continues, this Israeli ongoing oppression of the Palestinian people does not differentiate between Palestinian queers and non-queers. Not only Palestinian queers face these injustices on a daily basis and undergo the oppression, uh, the Israeli oppression like any other Palestinian, but also our name and struggle is often wrongly used and abused to pinkwash Israel's continuous crimes against the whole Palestinian population. In the last years, Israel has been leading an international campaign that tries to present Israel as the only democracy and the gay haven in the Middle East, while ironically portraying Palestinians who suffer every single day from Israel's state racism and terrorism as barbaric and homophobic. Thus, they conclude, we Palestinian queer activists call on queer groups, organizations, and individuals around the world to stand for justice and in the face of Israel's pinkwashing efforts through joining the global campaign for boycotts, divestment, and sanctions against Israel until it fully complies with international law and ends its occupation, colonization, and apartheid. In San Francisco in 2001, Queers Undermining Israeli Terrorism, acronym QUIT, uh, was founded. Queers Against Israeli Apartheid formed in Toronto in 2008. But the call from Palestinian queers brought new groups into being. In Vancouver, a group would borrow the Toronto's name to form here in this city. One of the, fo the foci of these solidarity groups has been the way in which Israel has co-opted lesbians and gays as part of their brand Israel cultural strategy, a strategy which included funding gay-themed films. The, uh, the stated brand Israel cultural strategy is simply to facilitate the creation of different representations of Israel, representations that did not reference the conflict but which simply show another, preferably young and modern side of Israel. So basically funding that went toward cultural organizations um, didn't dictate what the, the content of what these films should be, but it's very interesting. A lot of the contracts are available online and it does uh, require that the producers, so the artist or the director of a film, present themselves as a representative of the Israeli state, but never present themselves as a representative of the Israeli state. So you're always acting as an ambassador, but never officially. So they do bind them to the state in really interesting ways. But anyhow, for this reason, it seems to me that it's kind of ironic that the film that launched uh, Queers Against Israeli Apartheid Vancouver in 2012 was The Invisible Men, a documentary about three Palestinian men who are driven to escape uh, to Israel because their families have rejected them as a result of their being gay. 
Their crisis is amplified by the fact that they have no legal rights in Israel. They are illegals who live in fear every day of being caught. Now, I have not seen this film, so I'm not going to comment any further. But I want to draw our attention here to a statement made by one of the filmmakers after a screening in New York. According to a journalist, Yariv Moser was asked, uh, here we go. Oh, this is the film, The Invisible Men. Do you believe gay Palestinians should be granted asylum in Israel? And he replied, the issue is a thorny one for Israel, since the first Palestinian to be granted asylum could create a precedent for the Palestinian right of return. This, to me, is a really, really clear example of identifying as, not identifying with. The filmmaker identifies as a gay man, and thus sympathizes with other gay men facing a struggle around their sexuality and around homophobia. But unlike Black Laundry, he, all, uh, his identity as an Israeli prevents him from identifying with Palestinians as the refugees that they are. And here's just an example of, I love art. I love art activism. <laughs> I think it's awesome. So um, Frameline has been accepting money from the Israeli consulate for quite a number of years. And Quit in San Francisco has been every year pushing them to um, sign on to the boycott. But Frameline refuses to do so. So here's an example of um, activist art that was done in response to that. So the situation with Israeli funding being aimed at institutions like Pride and like queer film festivals um, is, to, to me, creates, from a historical point of view, a sort of perfect storm. For a long time now, Pride, the biggest and most visible cultural event in the LGBTQ community, or communities, I should say, has linked, um, has linked itself to the community. Oh, um, pardon me has offered itself up to the consumer marketplace since at least the 1990s. The new generation of pride leadership, uh, and I smile because I'm thinking, OK, well, how old am I? So when I came out, it was not quite, it was not commercialized. So I saw this happening in my own community. There was no commercial sponsorship whatsoever at pride when I came out. So I saw this happen, and I saw tr pr pride being transformed. The new generation of pride leadership sees integration with consumer capitalism as a sign of maturity. Now, I get that quote from the very last pride parade I ever went to, which was in San Francisco in around maybe 2004 or 5. And I was reading the guidebook. And it said, uh, back in the day, we used to reject uh, you know, corporate sponsorship, but we've matured. Yeah. All right. Now they come to us. How sweet is that? Of course, just because TD wants, uh, wants us to bank with them does not mean that we are fully liberated, right? There is not a queer among us, I dare say, who has not once given any thought to their choice of sexual partner, to how that information will be received by others. And nevertheless, at this historical moment in the West, to be pro-gay is, as Israel has grasped, a symbol of what a scholar has called civilizational aptitude. It is this that the government of Israel was advised to capitalize upon to transform, well, one of the things, uh, to transform international perceptions of the country from that of a state locked in a battle with Palestine, uh, or Palestinians, uh, a state that the United Nations uh, condemned for its human rights violations, to a state that is instead seen as a bastion of Western progressiveness surrounded by backward Muslim homophobes, to a land of sex, sun, and sand, labeled by those who, uh, which has been labeled by those who object to it, pinkwashing, defined as a deliberate strategy to conceal the continuing violations of Palestinians' human rights behind an image of modernity signified by Israel gay life. Palestinian queers have called upon the international queer community to join PACB, as we heard. So PACB is 
not in and of itself a queer organization. It's the Palestinian campaign for the academic and cultural boycott of Israel. Launched in Ramallah in April 2004 by a group of Palestinian academics and intellectuals, the campaign called for a boycott of all Israeli academic and cultural institutions until Israel complies with international law. And what that means is withdrawing from all lands occupied in 1967, including East Jerusalem, removing all its colonies in those lands, agreeing to United Nations resolutions relevant to the restitution of Palestinian refugee rights, and dismantling its system of apartheid. Supporting the boycott and opposing Israel apartheid has been and continues to be strongly opposed in and out of the queer, uh, queer community. Queers Against Israeli Apartheid's 2009 public appearance in, uh, uh, sorry, the Jewish uh, Tribute, uh, a Canadian-based newspaper, portrayed uh, Queers Against Israeli Apartheid's participation in the, the 2009 uh, Pride Parade in Toronto as, quote, a microcosm of the anti-Semitism happening globally. Lawyer Martin Gladstone lobbied to have uh, Queers Against Israeli Apartheid banned from Pride and to have Pride funding cut at all levels of government as well as corporate sponsorships. Their anticipated participation in the 2010 Pride Parade caused its detractors to put increasing pressure on the organizing committee to ban their participation and on city council to withhold Pride funding. And I don't know if you know, but Pride is massive in Toronto. I mean, it's huge. It's millions and millions of dollars. In a February 2010 letter, longtime gay activist and city councillor Kyle Ray argued that queer against, queers against Israeli apartheid's participation in Pride was, quote, not in keeping with the spirit and values of Pride Toronto. Pride attempted to defuse the conflict by announcing that all messages and signage would have to be pre-approved by a Pride Toronto ethics community. Well, let us praise Jim Deva, who fought the censorship battle here in Vancouver so many years ago, right? Queer communities have been subject to censorship, and so here we are being subject to censorship by our own community. So you can imagine the response to this was overwhelmingly negative, and Pride, uh, the organizing committee rescinded it shortly afterwards. In May 2010, the Pride committee then voted four to three to ban the term Israel, Israeli apartheid, claiming that the phrase was in breach of the city's anti-discrimination act policy. In an attempt to resolve matters in time for the 2010 parade, Pride revised their position yet again, proposing that all participants sign an agreement to abide by the city's anti-discrimination policy, and they allowed Queers Against Israeli Apartheid to march in the parade. Uh, a local Jewish group, uh, Kelanu, argued Pride is, quote, about the celebration of gay rights. It's not a platform from which to spew hatred and intolerance. Queers Against Israeli Apartheid's message is clearly discriminatory, divisive, and inflammatory. Mayor Ford, and several members of city council continued to insist that Pride funding should be withheld if, if Queers Against Israeli Apartheid participated in the 2011 Pride campaign. Uh, uh, here we go. So this is the, some images from their participation in Toronto uh, Pride. There's another one. Which I think was very effective. So this was, uh, uh, there was an attempt to take out this as an ad to put on buses and the TTC, Toronto Transit Commission, refused to allow the ad. So that's, this was a kind of response to that. Um, so here is opposition. Um, and here's the way in which uh, sort of, I don't want to say advocates of brand Israel, but advocates of uh, the view that I Israel is progressive uh, because it supports gay rights uh, represent themselves. So this is one example, uh, a picture that was taken on Pride Day showing that Israel supports gay marriage um, as a response to queers against Israeli apartheid. Uh, and here's, yeah. <laughs> now, so this was, right? Now, I'm a Canadian historian. What's Uncle Sam doing on a <laughs> Toronto poster? Like, I'm offended now. 
should be like a beaver or something. Right? <laughs> and here we go. This is like from the news yesterday, Saturday. John Tory. So it goes on. Controversy continues to plague queers against Israeli apartheid participation in Toronto Pride, morphing into what Barbara Kay argues is a, quote, annual controversy where gay rights, free speech, the role of government in funding civic events, and, of course, Middle Eastern geopolitics foment into a, quote, noxious summertime brew. Okay, so let's now move closer to home. So you know that... Uh, Queers Against Israeli Apartheid Vancouver protested the inclusion of the film The Invisible Men um, and uh, encouraged uh, out on screen to boycott, to join uh, the boycott. This year, this ad uh, by a group called Yad Biad. Now, uh, this is, uh, this is, this is, I'm gonna, taking my description of, wh of who this group is from the uh, Center for Israeli and Jewish Affairs website. Yad Biad is a non-denominational, non-partisan, Jewish, and pro-Israel LGBTQ advocacy group based in Vancouver. It participated in Pride this, this year, I think it's referring to, and had a tent at the Sunset Beach Festival where they, quote, showcased images from Pride Tel Aviv and engaged enthusiastic passers-by in conversations about Israel's thriving LGBTQ scene. So I think it's pretty clear, you know, that there's a parallel agenda or a complementary agenda at work there. There's a particular kind of message. So people took uh, umbrage to this ad being taken out and um, run in the Out on Screen Film Festival program this particular year. So this speaker series is called, uh, perhaps as you may have noticed, History in the Headlines. What prompted me to speak to this particular issue is the recent coverage of protests against Out on Screen's acceptance of this ad by Yad Biyab in its film program and the response of the festival's uh, president, Drew Dennis. The ongoing debate or discussion between Queers Against Israeli Apartheid Vancouver and Out on Screen began, as I mentioned, with this, as, uh, to the best of my knowledge, it began with the screening of uh, The Invisible Man in 2012. Queers Against Is uh, Israeli Apartheid Vancouver protested the inclusion of the film and called upon members of the queer community to support the boycott. Out on screen organizers invited them, the protesters, to present their point of view to the audience, their position, which I understand, I wasn't there, uh, they did eloquently and without protest from anyone in attendance. Queers Against Israeli Apartheid persisted in urging the film, board, film festival board to support the boycott. Last year, no statement was forthcoming from the board, and the call to support the boycott was reissued. At the, film, at the film festival's end, the board organized a public discussion on the issue. I was invited to chair. The panel was promoted as an opportunity to deepen our knowledge about the issues at hand. And I assumed that the board was interested in deepening their own knowledge since they had not yet publicly taken a position on the issue, to the best of my knowledge. Imagine my surprise then, when the only board member to attend was the director, Drew Dennis. Imagine still my horror when asked directly if the film festival was gonna take a position on the issue. Dennis stood up and apologized to the audience if for some reason people were under the impression that they had not. We have, he stated very definitively, decided not to support the boycott. We panelists, it seemed, had been graywashed. In the September 2 issue of Extra West this year, the matter received yet another airing, and once again, the panel discussion was used as evidence of the board's absolute open-mindedness about the issue, when in fact it was, and was once again, means to cover up, in my opinion, the board's decision not to support the boycott. Sponsoring community dialogues when one is not engaged in the dialogue itself is, I think it's fair to say, disingenuous, deceitful, graywashing. Out on screen and other film festival organizers did not go to Israel. Israel came to them. What responsibilities does the queer community have and to whom? How far does the queer gaze stretch? 
what is and is not a queer issue? These are important questions that go directly to the heart of what queer means and what queer is. And let me say that it is particularly painful to engage in a critique with one's own community. But being and living queer has never been an easy proposition. We must not hide from the difficult issues. We owe it to our community to speak with clarity about the positions we hold. The board that governs out on screen needs to come out, and the sooner, the better. Thank you.